Hey everybody, Chris here, and I am super excited and honored to announce that I have Ben Kruger with me to talk about his digital nomad life. And uh, Ben is the the uh, what do you call yourself? CEO, president of Cashflow Podcasting. Uh, owner, podcast educator. Podcast educator. I like that. <laughs> we'll go with that anyway. So uh, Ben, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, Chris, this is great. Always pumped to talk uh, location independent living and kind of living on purpose and by choice. So yeah, excited with that uh, you reached out and happy to talk. Awesome. Well, uh, my my audience are the people who are interested in this lifestyle and and probably will gain great inspiration from from people like you who have done it successfully. So uh, really excited to talk to you and get some get some of your ideas and your advice. And I think my my listeners will appreciate it greatly. So um, I wanted to know how long have you been uh, a digital man? How long, well, how long have you been uh, location independent anyway? Yeah, uh, good question. Um, while financially supporting myself, uh, I would say since sometime in 2013. Um, and before that, uh, it, I so. Uh, it's kind of a hard question to answer from a from a yeah, but when actually financially supporting myself independent of of others and going to school and that kind of stuff, I'd say 2013 um, is when I kind of started that, and I started out in the Philippines. Oh, okay, very cool. And how did you? Um, what was your first first project or your first job or gig oh, that let you be independent there were quite a few failed ones um <laughs> yeah, yeah so that's that's usually the case yeah um uh so i had you know the gopros the action camera action sports cameras mm -hmm. um when you buy a gopro at least back in that day it doesn't come with a case it comes with a few you know things that go with it um but i had a buddy when i was living in idaho who just kept it in a tube sock in his sock drawer. And I was like, that seems kind of silly. Uh, <laughs> you know, you've got this expensive piece of equipment and you're storing it in a sock. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so I got onto some forums, uh, like some extreme sports forums and started posting to get ideas of, you know, what do other people use for their GoPro to keep their GoPros in? And everybody mm -hmm. had some like homemade weird solution <laughs> that they came up with. So I made a few posts. I was like, hey, you know, I'm considering uh, creating a case for GoPro owners that's hard shell. It's waterproof. You could drop it off a building. You know, you can store multiple GoPros in it if you want. Um, and I got a lot of interest and in response. So I actually bought some uh, Pelican cases, those like hard shell, you know, Pelican cases with yeah. pick and pluck foam and just like pulled the foam out. <laughs> oh, I gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I, I think I bought like five or 10 or something just, you know, straight off of pelicancase.com or whatever their, whatever their retailer is. And, yeah. uh, I actually sold them all within like a week, like real quick. Wow. Um, sold them locally or you sold them on the internet? I uh, sold one locally and the most, all of the rest of them on the internet. Um, so I just had people send money to my PayPal and, oh. uh, like I literally would just like pluck the, pluck the foam out and then send it to them. Like that's all I did. Um, yeah, <laughs> so that kind of uh, confirmed that the, that people wanted it. Um, so then I started looking into like getting these cases produced so that I wasn't gangstering Pelican cases and just like pulling the yeah. foam out. Um, but as I was looking into it, no matter who I had produced them or how I did the foam or, you know, whatever, essentially it was going to be about $30,000 for a first production run. And oh, I didn't have $30,000. Um, and I didn't know... Yeah. I had no idea what I was doing from an e-commerce standpoint. I had never done e-commerce before. Um, so quite honestly, the idea just kind of fizzled because I was like, well, uh, you know, I don't know what the hell I'm doing and I don't have 30 grand sitting around. So yeah, uh, that idea, that idea fizzled and never became anything. But it is if you, you know, Google GoPro cases, hard shell cases, waterproof cases, 
I think there's like seven or eight companies like that now. So it was well, a very, and- you know, legitimate business idea that I just didn't have the business chops to make work. Yeah, um, I see what you mean. So yeah, that's one of the that, that's one of the flops at the beginning. <laughs> at yeah. the beginning, um, I had a very similar experience yeah. trying to create a physical product. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's. I wanted to. I was annoyed by the uh, by the touch screens when the when when all the all the phones turned to touch screen and um, you know there used to be Blackberries which had the were smartphones but had a keyboard so I wanted to create a uh, like a, a keyboard like a Bluetooth keyboard attachment for phones. Okay. And so it turned out that t- takes a ton of money to make a prototype. <laughs> As I, it so happens, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I've been in the same boat. I know what you mean. Yep. Uh, yeah. It's it's especially when you don't know what the hell you're doing and you're like looking up manufacturers online and you're calling them up and trying to figure yeah. out how to make it work. It's pretty. It can be pretty daunting. Um, it's ch- the the landscape has changed a lot in the five six years since I tried to do that. I think it'd be a lot easier to bring something to market now um, just out of, you know, the volume of people that are doing it and the amount of education that's out there. Um, and I'm pretty sure you could do a production run, a smaller production run now than you could have back in the day. Um, but that's how it goes. I gotcha. Well, that's cool. What was what was the first uh, first thing that, that actually was sustained, which was successful? Yeah, the uh, podcast business actually was the first thing that really worked in any real sense of the word. Um, the At the time, um, I was listening to a podcast called Tropical MBA, which if someone's in your audience, they are probably either familiar with or they will go check out very shortly because yeah. um, <laughs> it's all about, you know, it's a podcast for laptop lifestyle entrepreneurs. Um and so I was an avid listener of that show back in like 2012. And uh, at the time, I was living in Boise, Idaho, uh, working for a small online marketing company. And they were talking about an internship where you lived in the Philippines and helped a small resort do online marketing in exchange for room and board. Um, oh, and so I was like, this is my chance. So, uh, you know, I put together an application video and poured my heart and soul into that. Um, cause I just, you know, you know, when you just know like something's for you and you'll like yeah. pull out all the stops and make it happen. Um, yeah, absolutely. so yeah, I, I applied for that and, um, got an email from the guy who I was replacing. I think the subject line was like, pack your shit. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh so I think it was about two weeks later, I was in the Philippines, um, and tr- I'm going somewhere with this story. The <laughs> the uh, guy who is one of the hosts of that show, Dan Andrews, um, I got to meet him and got to know you know him and his co-host Ian, um, and got to talking to him quite a bunch. Uh, and so we just have some beers and chill and hang out at this resort in the Philippines. And he was constantly mentioning how much work the podcast was from a production standpoint. Um, and he had a few team members that were doing it, but he wanted them to be working on other things. Um, so at a certain point I actually, uh, what he, he kept saying like, Hey, you know what you should do is do like a podcasting service. And I was pretty resistant at the beginning. I didn't want to do a service. I wanted to do a physical product, and I did, you know, I didn't want the customer support and that kind of stuff that a service brings. And yeah. uh, after, after, at one point when I had, I think it was like forty-three or forty-seven dollars to my name, and I had a four hundred dollar student loan payment coming up, I was like, "All right, I think I could do a podcast service." <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah, just talked over with Dan what they needed for their show and how they would want a service to work if they were to use one. Um, and kind of made a handshake deal with him on the spot to, to take over the show. So that he was my first client and because they already had a pretty big audience when we did, I did really good work for him. He just started referring people my way and that was, that was the start. I'm kidding. That's awesome. Yeah. So how big a market is that? How many, how many people are there out there who are trying to do podcasts who, who want your service? 
<clears throat> yeah, so now it's it's huge. Um, back in like 2013, when I first started it, podcasting was still very new. Um, it it wasn't new. It was about five six years old at that point. Um, but it was new from a mass market standpoint. Um, and it was still gaining traction from, you know, a lot of people had never heard of what a podcast was. They didn't know how it worked. They didn't know how to get one or subscribe to one. Um, whereas now the landscape's pretty different. Um, it is, has just grown bonkers. Um, and it's more and more accepted. People really understand the value of what a podcast can achieve, uh, from, a business perspective. So that's where our market has actually shifted and who we work with. Our niche has shifted quite a bit over the last, you know, mm-hmm. five years. So okay. essentially at this point, we only work with advisory based business models. So these are coaches, consultants, um, financial advisory companies, essentially businesses where they make money on sharing advice um gotcha. in, in some way so yeah. you know could be online courses could be memberships and masterminds that kind of thing um mm-hmm. but that's the business model we have found is a sweet spot for podcasting um and so that's that's our market and it's even with that very specific narrow kind of niche it's massive um okay. so there there's a uh, Edison Research puts out a study every year of around podcasting and the new stats. Um, uh-huh. And I probably should have pulled it up before this conversation, but uh, it's consistently grown in the number of people who actively listen to podcasts, the number of podcast episodes someone who listens to episodes listens to on a weekly basis, the number of people who recognize what a podcast is and know how to get one. Um, you know, it's been on the upward trend since yeah i'd say 2011 i think um that's yeah. right around when kind of started ticking up i believe it i think i listened listened to my first podcast maybe a year and a half ago yep <laughs> i was and, not uh, not an early adopter on that one yeah i mean you know i literally listened to one podcast and that was it that was that was the thing and so oh, really? you know i don't have a history in podcasting i had done some video editing in high school um so uh-huh. when i started working on dan's show i literally just youtubed you know how to edit a podcast um no and figured it out on kind of on the fly i didn't tell him that i'd you know <laughs> he's like, oh yeah i've done audio production you know uh, but i figured i could figure it out how hard could it be yeah. Yeah. So the service you provide is you uh you you edit the like the raw footage, probably put a nice intro on it, you know, make the I don't know, mess with the sound levels. Yeah, so I don't know what goes into it. The it's a good question. So the service that we do now, um, the idea is a podcast host can just be a host and we are their podcasting department for hire. So I see. Um essentially they record the audio content they send us the raw files of their conversation and yes we do the audio editing we take out ums and ahs and all the weird parts of the conversation long awkward pauses that kind of stuff yeah uh, you know anytime they talk about things that uh or like any editing that needs to be done within the conversation we handle we add an audio mastering element at, as well as intros and outros and any other audio branding or sound effects, that kind of stuff. Um, and then we also, with every episode, write up a show notes post, kind of like a short blog post that has some intro paragraphs, some bullet points, and we link out to all the tools, people, resources, websites, you know, whatever they talk about in that episode that's of note for the listener, we pull all of those out and write them up in the post so that that's a resource that people can go back to somebody's website to find out um, okay. and, and kind of refer to. So uh, once we kind of have those two things done, then we schedule the audio and the show notes post to go live on the client's website and out to iTunes, Stitcher, all the podcast platforms at the proper time. So that way, I see. you know, literally the host just does the recording and we handle all the back end process for them. Yeah. Oh, that sounds wonderful. <laughs> sounds like a yeah. huge help for people with podcasts. Well, that's the idea. You know, they, they're they business owners first, not podcast tech junkies. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. 
So uh, do you do you still do uh, much of the 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 work yourself, or do you do you hire out people to do all of it? So at the moment, my role in the company is um, as kind of team and project manager, and I'm the uh, the only salesperson within the company at the moment. Okay. Um, so we're in the process of growing beyond that, but I don't do any of the audio editing. I don't do any of the show notes writing. Um, and I actually don't do any of the launches myself either anymore. Um, so we've got uh, internal team members for handling all that stuff. Um, and we've really done a lot of work on building out standard operating procedures, good old uh, SOPs. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that with all of our clients and all of our processes, like everything's pretty dialed in from a stand uh, from a process standpoint, um, even though it's constantly evolving. I gotcha. So uh, you have you have like full time employees, or you just um, hire freelancers? Yeah, they're all technically um, ten ninety nine contractors, but okay. um, they're they're all consistent. So they're all part time with us. Um, but yeah, everybody, everybody that works with us is, you know, consistent. So we don't bring on people for one-off projects. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we've got a pretty solid team, uh, right now we are seven. Um, oh. so we're still a pretty small, pretty small organization, but I quite like it that way. Cause, yeah. um, it's That's very much, you. yeah, it's very much a lifestyle business, not a grow it as big and as fast as I can kind of a business. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I feel you there for sure. Yeah, which, you know, that's kind of the point of these kind of conversations is it is a lifestyle business, not a not a ego business or a, you know, get it as big as you can kind of a business. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that's probably what most of my listeners are interested in as well. So uh, what, what did you do before becoming a digital nomad? Do you have a, you have a normal job? doing something um so i i graduated university i went to ohio state uh oh sorry the ohio state university <laughs> uh, and graduated in 2011 and then i was actually a forklift operator for a couple of months rocking it out oh, okay. um and then i i went out and lived in idaho uh with my brother for a year and when i was there when I showed up, I had three or four job interviews lined up for the very first week that I got there. Of course, none of those panned out. Um, oh. So I was jobless for a little while trying to figure figure that out. Um, and I ended up taking a temporary job as a door-to-door -door internet salesman. Ha ha. Oh. It was fantastic. <laughs> nah, it sucked. Um, and I sucked at it. I didn't make a sale for like two weeks straight my first two weeks and it was a hundred percent commission job. So, oh, um, yeah, yeah, it was a bit of a rough two weeks, but, um, ended up getting, ended up working at two different, uh, online marketing companies within that year. Um, one of them worked mostly with copier printer companies. Oh, okay. Um, and the other one was, uh, these two guys that kind of had, uh, they did a lot of like local business marketing, like getting people onto Google, uh, you know, Google for local businesses for like auto body repair shops and restaurants and, you know, local brick and mortar stuff. Um, but then when I got that internship with the TMBA, you know, um, I didn't work with either of them anymore. And, and towards the end of that six month internship is when I started cashflow podcasting. So, you know, I, I really never had <clears throat> much in terms of like a corporate full-time job. Um, I always well, just kind of wung it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like you had a lot of marketing experience before you went off on your own. In theory. Um, yeah, mostly a lot of it was self-taught still though. Um, yeah. I do remember, uh, so I was a, a business admin major in university with kind of a focus on marketing, um, and yeah. entrepreneurship. And in my four year degree, uh, there was a one hour class period as part of one of our classes dedicated to online marketing. 
Um, okay. Yeah, that was it. So that's that's what I had to go on. Um, yeah, yeah. And of course, that's all I do now. But um, it was it really I was I was very interested in it because like everybody in your audience, I was interested in figuring out like, OK, sweet. Obviously, if I want to work from anywhere, the Internet's going to be a big part of that. So yeah. what's happening in online marketing? You know, what what are the current trends? How do I even get into this? And that's, you know, those were the pretty early days of SEO. Not not super early, but I don't know, middle early. Um, so I was just researching a bunch about affiliate marketing and SEO and local marketing. And, you know, that was kind of the jam back then. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, my, that's been my experience too. That pretty much anything useful you want to learn, you have to learn yourself. So I, yeah, that uh, seems to be the case. Yeah, <laughs> I have a bachelor's degree in economics and a and an MBA. And, oh wow! Yeah, uh, which you know, I only went back for the MBA just because I couldn't find a job. Yep. <laughs> 2010, my bachelor's degree was useless. So I don't know. My my crappy logic at the time thought, oh well, I got one degree and it didn't work. So maybe if I get another degree. If I go for two, that's the that'll be the ticket. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So um, uh, <laughs> I, I don't feel so smart anymore. But you know, I figured out that that if you want to learn something, there's lots of useful things you can learn. But uh, if yeah. you're uh, if you're paying ten thousand dollars a year to learn them, they're probably not so good. <laughs> well, and it's not. Yeah, it's not the uh, it's not the issue. I don't think uh, is paying. Yeah, let's say ten grand a year or upwards to learn it i think it's usually the challenge is when you come out of let's say an mba what yeah. you have at the end of that is a piece of paper that says you're qualified for a, a potential jobs those jobs may or may not exist they may or may not be in your area they may or may not be something that you're even interested in um so yeah i think i think the whole you know college degree and mba thing is a bit of a bit of a funky deal now uh it's a lot different than it used to be where you know that was kind of a, a central part of your training um now it pretty much i think just signifies that you can dedicate your se yourself to something for four years and you know so then employers can check that box off and move on yeah um, exactly yeah so kind of funky. if i had to do it over again i wouldn't even i wouldn't have even gone for the bachelor's I like to say that, but I also had such a good time socially in college that I'm like, oh, I wouldn't want to lose that, though. That's <laughs> maybe, true. Yeah, that's maybe true. I'd just live on campus and be a bum. It'd be great. <laughs> yeah, it'd be right. a lot cheaper than going to school, I guess, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, I, that would be funny, actually, if somebody, somebody like invented a method to do that, because I bet you could. You could just get like one of those apartments yeah. that's right beside the campus and you still go to all the college events, right? And you still have all the fun, but you don't go to the classes and you don't pay. <laughs> be, yeah, it'd be like a, like an out of out of uh, off campus membership or some yeah, you know, some yeah. BS. That'd be that'd be fun. Life Van Wilder or something. Exactly. There you go. Yeah. Then you could just be a party planner and charge for your party planning, you know, skills. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that'd be awesome. Uh, that'd be the dream. <laughs> So, uh, what uh, what motivated you to to want to uh, be location independent, be an entrepreneur? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I think it's for me, it's just kind of a personality thing. Um, I've always very much valued freedom and independence, um, and I've also very much valued and been interested in a lot of different things. Um, so, you know, I have a lot of different hobbies and interests. They're almost all active outdoors things. Um, and I think I recognized very early on that I like, I like to do things by choice, not because I needed to, or because I felt like I have to, or because I, you know, my family expected me to, or, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think it just always appealed to me from that standpoint. And, you know, my family is very much, um, very much from a mindset of, you know, hardworking in the agriculture space. So, you know, they, oh, really? okay. their families are involved in agriculture and farming. Um, and there's this mentality of work hard to earn 
just enough um, and kind of scrape by. That's yeah. kind of the mentality. And I really didn't like that mentality just from a, I'm like, there's got to be an easier, more fun mm-hmm. way to do this than yeah, yeah, for off sure. just to scrape by. So, and I don't say this in any way to, you know, hate on my parents or, or farmers or, you know, any of that. Cause actually I know, you know, farmers who do really well. And I know farmers who kind of set their life up in more of a, a, you know, they do it on purpose and they do it with, with very purposeful choices. Um, so I think it really kind of comes down to a mentality and approach to life more than anything else. So I don't know if that answers the question or not, but that's what I got. (laughs) Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I, I (laughs) totally feel you on all of that. Yeah. Feel the same way. Um, yeah, I, I just did a webinar last night actually about a big part of it was saying that if you working harder is, is probably not going to make you successful if you're working harder doing what's already not making you successful. Not working. Yeah. 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 yeah I think, I think the, the entrepreneurial mindset generally comes down to figuring out what's effective and what moves the needle forward as opposed to what, uh, like what actions create vanity metrics or what actions make you feel good about progress, even if progress isn't being made. So it's the 80 hour work weeks and it's the, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, maybe you did 12 talks this year, but none of those talks were paid and none of them turned anyone into clients or none of them, you know, actually achieved any particular goal. You just kind of did that thing that strokes your ego a little bit or makes you feel like you're being productive, you know, when at the end of the day, maybe you are, maybe you aren't, but, um, yeah, I, I tend to be more geared towards the, the results side of things when possible. Yeah, absolutely. I think I, I, I resonate with that, that problem that you, if you're working, you think that you're making progress, but you know, <laughs> that's not necessarily the case. Uh, yeah. my, have you ever heard of a book called U Squared? Uh, yes, I have. Yes, Richard. I have. Little gray book. Yeah, yeah, exactly. My my mentor uh, had me buy that book and read it every week for a year. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nice. Yeah. It reminds what? me of the the story at the at the beginning about uh, the the little fly that's trying to fly through the window, and he keeps yep. pushing, and it and his his strategy is just to try harder. When the you know ten feet away the door is open and he could just fly out the open door. Yep. And uh, I'm pretty sure that story ends with the fly dead on the windowsill, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he worked really hard, so you know, there's that. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe he thought that he was making progress. Uh, but, yeah. Definitely. Definitely opens your eyes. Yes. Big time. Um. Let's see. You, you told me you're uh, you're in Vermont right now, right? Yep, I'm currently living in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, been here a little over a year. Burlington, okay. Yeah. I don't know anything anything about Vermont except for uh, maple syrup and and Ben and Jerry's. Yep. Well, that's about all there is to know. Uh, <laughs> I um, before I came here, I actually didn't know anything about Vermont either. Um, I ended up coming here with a girlfriend at the time because her family was in New England. And so we wanted to kind of be close um, to her family. And I really enjoyed we had lived in Boulder, Colorado for a year and I loved that. Um, And so I was kind of like, how can I find the Boulder, Colorado of the Northeast? (laughs) I Um, see. And that's essentially what Burlington is. So that's that's why I ended up coming here. it's it's vermont's an interesting state it's very it does not have a lot from a population standpoint i think they're right around uh, well i might i feel like i need to look this up so i don't you know (laughs) perjure myself but i'm pretty sure they're right around a million people in the entire state um and burlington is their biggest city uh, it's not the capital, but it's their biggest city population wise uh, at about 40 some thousand. So oh, it's wow. not a, you know, it's a it's a big town or a small city, whichever way you want to call it that. Um, but it's very much my style. Like I'm not a big city living person. 
I'm yeah. very much, you know, either very much on the outskirts of a city, so I can easily be out in nature. Um, I got you. Yeah, or in a smaller town like this. But I really like Vermont and Burlington in particular. It's very, it's a very um, independent thinking place. There's a lot of kind of progressive thinking. There's a lot of um, really intelligent people here mixed with kind of that down home country, you know, live off the land style of individual as well um you know and everybody that lives here hikes bikes is outdoors at any chance that they can get you know um and there's just more to do here than than there is time in the day which is my kind of place yeah uh, that sounds awesome yeah so are you there are you there long term or uh, just there for a little while yeah um so up until moving to Burlington, uh, I kind of had the mindset that I needed a reason to stay in a place. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas I feel like in Burlington, I need a reason to leave. So yeah, I see. Yeah. Like, I feel like this is kind of my home spot uh, now. And it doesn't mean that I won't leave. But yeah. I needed I need a good reason to leave. Whereas before I needed a good reason to stay somewhere. I gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's nice to have a home base. You know, I, I some people do do the completely nomadic thing, but that's that's a little rough for me. You know, I like to have somewhere to call home, even even totally. if I'm only there a few months a year. Yeah, and it's obviously all personal preference, um, but I'm I I think I'm the same way, and I've always done even kind of in the nomadic process over the last six or so years. I don't think I ever lived anywhere for any less than three months, actually any less than six months. I think I only had one spot for three months. So like I always kind of did what I called slow travel. Yeah. Um, yeah. As opposed to, you know, the classic go to Europe for a week vacation and try to see 82 countries and spend oh, all your yeah. time on planes and trains and automobiles. And that's that's not my jam. So um, yeah, first time I went to Europe, that's what I did. Yes, yeah. that's, that's one of the big the big uh, benefits to the nomadic uh, or being location independent is you can afford to go somewhere for three months and actually get to know the place. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it costs you the same as it would in just living normally in the U S or, you know, depending on how you do it, maybe slightly more, maybe slightly less. So yeah, you, know, yeah. you don't even have to really budget a whole lot from a vacation standpoint. Yeah. yeah. Some places you can live on a lot less. Yeah. And live well too. I mean, I the, the first time I, I got here to Medellin, I was amazed. Like my money goes three times as far. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like it, I, I uh, at that point I was working a, a remote job, like a full time job. So making American Beautiful. salary coming here in in Colombia, and all of a sudden, my I effectively tripled my salary by taking a two hundred dollar plane flight. Yeah, <laughs> that's incredible. so great. That's so great. I love it. Because, yeah, uh, so I lived in Portugal for a year and it was the exact same, you know, earning U.S. dollars and living in Portugal where, you know, the euro wasn't an, a fantastic exchange rate. But uh, actually, before we were uh, recording, we were talking a little bit about Portugal. The food is really fantastic and, and incredibly cheap. The wine and kind of the nightlife in general is really fantastic and very cheap. Um, and yeah, like you can rent a fantastic place for less than what I'm paying right now in the U S for rent. So yeah. yeah, it's, it's really cool. Kind of the opportunities that can be had now where you can earn an income in one country and then have the expenses of living in a completely different place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty, pretty incredible. And I think that's kind of like completely outside of the reality of most Americans. Well, you know, I, sure. And it wasn't even possible eight, 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people like I, I've had people ask me, like, how are you? How are you making so much money that you can travel all the time? And I'm like, I spend less money because I travel. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm saving money. Yeah, it's such a it's it's a very it's a it's a very specific switch in like the way you think about trap because I think anybody anybody who like works a nine to five or works you know and lives in a in a consistent spot usually they think of travel as expensive 
-hmm. Whereas if you think of it as kind of like living and integrating travel into your lifestyle, then it can be just as just the same or way cheaper. Um, it can also be way more expensive. So it kind of depends on how you want to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. true. Depending on where you go and, and what you do. That's right. Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, there's there's a lot you can learn to, to I mean, I don't I don't like to, to, to try to get into that like budget travel niche because you can travel on nothing. Right. I yeah. mean, Europeans do that all the time. It's kind of funny, like uh, it, especially here in Colombia, the Colombians get kind of annoyed at them because they're such giant cheapskates. Oh, interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They, they they do some crazy stuff. I mean, they come they have like they, they save up enough money for a plane ticket and then they go there and they're like, oh, we'll just figure it out as we go along. Yep. And uh, oh. they hitchhike everywhere, which in South America is not the greatest idea. <laughs> Maybe um, not the safest, but hey, you know. And then they, they go find a hostel where they can work at the front desk and, you know, make a make a few pennies there to, to um, I don't know, buy an empanada every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it all comes down to, to your priorities. If your priority is to try to figure out how to do it cheaply, then yeah, you can absolutely do it cheaply. You may not have much of an experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. And... Not to say that having an experience costs money because you can do free shit and still have an amazing experience. But sure. um, yeah, I really like the the opportunity to it's fun to kind of live well in different places um, and see the cost difference, see what opportunities or what what's there that's at, on offer that isn't on offer in other places. Um, yeah, and kind exactly. of like fully, fully partake in that place, whatever shape, form or activity that looks like, um, you know, that's kind of one of the benefits of getting to live there is you get to actually participate. Um, yeah, I think that's one of my favorite parts. Yeah, absolutely. You, uh, <laughs> get to, get to get experience the new things and the, the, usually the best experiences are inexpensive in my Almost always. Yeah, almost always. And that's one of the challenges that I always found um, is I always found like, or I always felt like I was really figuring a place out right about when I was leaving. Um, yeah. You know, whether it was at three months, six months, a year, uh, like I always felt like I was really just finally nailing down that place when I left, uh, like right about when I was leaving. Um, yeah. And one thing that I've also found is like having friends and a network of people that you know makes any living anywhere and doing fun, cool things so much more cheap because, you know, somebody that knows somebody who has a boat and invites you to go out boating with their friends or yeah. you know, knowing somebody who organizes a trip to go uh, float the river or you know, like any of those scenarios, like uh, here, you know, I've got a buddy that we go snowboarding all the time. Um, but if you go at, to different resorts, it can get really expensive. Yeah. But, it, you know, there's a resort in his hometown. And because his family kind of has connections in that town, they got us some free lift tickets. Oh, um, awesome. And, you know, it's like stuff like that, that you if I just got here a week ago, I wouldn't know anybody to kind of have those connections for any of those opportunities to even come my way. So if I wanted to go somewhere, I'd be paying full price for it. Um, so yeah, it's kind of an interesting one because, you know, the more kind of integrated you get into a spot, the cheaper it actually gets, I've found. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And the more that you can actually give and share back with someone, because if you just showed up somewhere, you don't have any, you can't connect somebody to somebody else because you're brand new there too. Yeah, absolutely. That's true. So, uh, if you could think of uh, think of somebody who is in your situation right before you became location independent, what what advice would you give that person? Like how, or what? Well, even better, what what advice would you give yourself? What do you know now that you wish you knew then? Well, good question. Good question. Because I was all about it. I just was like waiting or kind of chomping for an opportunity. 
So yeah. maybe that's it. Yeah, it's like um, you already uh, had the mindset down. Yeah, that's... like I was already in it from a mindset standpoint, but I had no, I had no idea how to make it happen. I had no idea what that looked like, and I knew didn't have any money, didn't have any runway. So like, if I quit my job, then I I essentially would be out of money in like a month. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So I didn't have any money to start anything on my own. Um, and so the the internship thing just kind of fell in my lap. And it wasn't like I was making money with the internship. It was literally a trade for food and housing. But then I didn't really have any expenses. So it kind of worked out. Um, so I think the biggest thing that I would have advised myself was to not be afraid to either do like find a job that I could work remotely mm -hmm. or like hustle to get contract remote work um, so that I could financially support myself in that transition um, as opposed to just waiting for the right opportunity to plop in my lap. Because um, I think that's what I pretty well ended up doing was just being interested in traveling and, and working from elsewhere and kind of having the location independent lifestyle, but mm -hmm. I don't know how much longer it would have taken me to actually make that happen on my own. Had I not gotten that internship, probably quite a while. I gotcha. Yeah. Um, so it's one of those, like, if you want to do it, make it happen, but know that you don't have to just like quit your job and walk away and, and whatever your next project needs to succeed or you, or you're finished because it won't. I'll tell you that right now it won't. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, you might as well might as well come up with you know at least some form of income, whether it's contract work or remote work or something that you know you can rely on or fall back on, um, so that you can actually bet on yourself with some form of confidence, and you're not backed into a corner. Yeah, yeah, for sure that helps a lot with the mindset. Big time, yeah, big time. So I think that was, you know, I was sweating, sweating buckets. I remember, uh, in, at the end of the living in the Philippines, uh, I didn't have enough money to fly back to the U S to like see my family. Um, so that's after the Philippines, I was living in Thailand for six months. Uh, okay. and I went to Thailand because I didn't have enough money to fly back to the U S. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and I didn't want to admit to my parents that that was the case. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it all worked out. But yeah, it was a little tight there for a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I bet. It seems like a lot of entrepreneurs have stories like that. Yep, absolutely. So, uh, what's something that you're working on now? Any, any anything new down the pipeline? Anything you're trying to add to your service offering? Something like that. Yeah. Um, so we're not changing a whole lot about, well, actually we're, we're updating a little bit about how our service works. Um, just kind of the deliverables of the service and we're refining exactly who we work with and kind of the structure of, of how the process works, um, which I'm always doing, um, and, yeah. and really enjoy the process of doing cause that's kind of my jam. Yeah. Um, one of the goals that I'm working towards um, with this process is in October, uh, I'm doing a Morocco trip for three weeks, uh, a little over three weeks. Um, and my goal is to be fully um, off the grid for that whole trip um, and for the business to have progressed without me. So not just yeah. existed and you know, things come to a grinding halt while I'm gone and then I pick it back up when I get back. Um, so in order for that to happen, there needs to be, you know, a certain number of things in place. I need to have a salesperson that replaces me in the sales role. Oh, yeah. um, you know, there's a handful of things that need to need to happen. So um, that's kind of what I'm working on right now. And that's kind of my motivation at the moment is, you know, this trip is happening. And I'm going to be off grid no matter what. So I got to kind of get my shit in one pile and make it happen before then. Because if I don't, all hell is going to be breaking loose. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Good motivation there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's good. It's a good hard deadline. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. 
Yeah. So um, if uh, if listeners want to want to follow you, want to learn more about you, your uh, it's cashflow cashflowpodcasting.com, right? That's your business. Correct. Yep. Correct. So yeah, anybody looking for for uh, looking to start a podcast and don't don't want to worry about the details themselves, that's a seems like a huge value add, certainly from my standpoint. And then uh, anything else like social media, any people want to follow you? You know, I'm awful at social media. Um, I have a Facebook account. I haven't updated it in a long time. Yeah, I'm, you know, I don't. I really don't have much of a following in the location independent nomadic space, just because. I, like I'm, I'm not really super engaged in those communities. I've kind of like do my business and keep my head down. Um, I got you. Okay. Which is a little bit kind of sad because then you know it's hard. It's hard to find case studies more case studies because i know there's a lot of people like me they're not super you know engaged in the nomadic communities so a lot of those those people as examples and case studies kind of disappear into the ether because they don't have audiences or followings or whatever um yeah i guess my email list is probably the best way to go at at cashflowpodcasting.com you can find places to sign up for stuff um okay perfect well, yeah, you're uh, you're emerging from the ether here, so all <laughs> uh, 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 Yeah, <laughs> thanks for the opportunity, Chris. It's been great chatting, and um, yeah, if anybody is considering the nomadic lifestyle, considering location independence, they've got questions, and you know they've heard a part of my story that for whatever reason they think um, you know I could be helpful or answer a question, I'm happy to hit me up um, via email at at cashflowpodcasting.com and i'm happy to help out awesome well thanks so much ben i'm so glad that you came on uh i'm sure my my listeners will find it uh very helpful very inspirational i loved your stories so fantastic uh, thanks a lot yeah thank you ma'am thank you